So once again, I'm Romana Diana Castillo, your online learning coordinator for today's philosophy class. And so our topic for today is all about prudence. So let's define what is prudence. Prudence, as defined by the Merriam-Webster Dictionary, is the ability to govern and discipline oneself by the use of reason, and it is one of the four cardinal virtues. It is also called the mother of all virtues. The word has been derived from an old French word prudence, which has also been derived from the Latin word prudentia, meaning foresight or sagacity. Prudence is most commonly associated with words such as wisdom, insight, and knowledge. Prudence by itself cannot perform actions and is concerned solely with knowledge. However, all virtues must be regulated by it. Virtue in this regard is the ability to judge between virtues and vicious actions, not only in a general sense, but with regards to appropriate actions at a given time and place. For example, distinguishing courageous acts from reckless and cowardly is an act of prudence. It is an intellectual and moral virtue that seeks to direct particular human acts through righteousness towards a good end. With it being a moral virtue, it is not possible to be prudent and not morally good in the process as the prudent man knows the good as opposed to the person who only knows the good. The word or this word has also become synonymous or the same to cautiousness. The word prudence may imply a reluctance to take risks, which remains a virtue with respect to unnecessary risks. Prudence is the application of universal principles to particular situations, and so an understanding of universal moral principles is absolutely necessary. But since prudence deals in particulars in the here and now of real situations, a number of other intellectual qualities are also necessary if one is to choose rightly, qualities that one does not necessarily acquire in a classroom setting. St. Thomas Aquinas refers to this as integral parts of prudence without which there is no prudence, just as there is no house without a roof, walls, and a foundation. Prudence was considered by the ancient Greeks and later on by the Christian philosophers, most notably Thomas Aquinas, as the cause, measure, and form of all virtues. It is considered to be the auriga virtutum or the charioteer of the virtues. It is the cause in the sense that the virtues, which are defined to be the perfected ability of man as a spiritual person, spiritual personhood in a classical Western understanding means having intelligence and free will achieve their perfection only when they are founded upon prudence, that is to say, upon the perfected ability to make right decisions. For instance, a person can leave temperance when he has acquired the habit of deciding correctly the actions to take in response to his instinctual cravings. Its function is to point out which course of action is to be taken in any concrete circumstances. It has nothing to do with directly willing the good it discerns.
Ordinance has a directive capacity with regard to the other virtues. It lights the way and measures the arena for their exercise. Without prudence, bravery becomes foolhardiness or nonsense. Mercy sinks into weakness and temperance into fanaticism. Its office is to determine for each in practice those circumstances of time, place, manner, and etc., which should be observed and which the scholastics comprise under the term medium rationalists. So it is that while it qualifies the intellect and not the will, it is nevertheless rightly styled a moral virtue. Prudence is considered the measure of moral virtues since it provides a model of ethically good actions. The work of art is true and real by its correspondence with the pattern of its prototype in the mind of the artist. In similar fashion, the free activity of man is good by its correspondence with the pattern of prudence. In Greek and scholastic philosophy, form is the specific characteristic of a thing that makes it what it is. With this language, prudence confers upon other virtues the form of its inner essence, that is, its, its specific character as a virtue. For instance, not all acts of telling the truth are considered good considered as done with a virtue of honesty. What makes telling the truth a virtue is whether it is done with prudence. So, let's discuss the integral parts of prudence. So, prudence begins with an understanding of the first principles of practical reason which St. Thomas Aquinas called Sindere. It is a natural habit by which we are inclined to a number of ends. Now the good is the object of desire. Hence the object of these inclinations are goods, and since these goods are not outside the human person, but are aspects of the human person, they are called human goods. There are a number of human goods to which every human person is naturally inclined. These goods are not known by the senses, but by the intellect. So they are desired, not by the sense appetite, but primarily by the will, the rational appetite. Thus, they are not sensible goods, but intelligible goods. These intelligible human goods include human life, the knowledge of truth, the intellectual apprehension and enjoyment of beauty, leisure, play and art, sociability, religion, integrity, and marriage. So, life. The human person has a natural inclination to preserve his life. For he sees his life as basically good. So it is true actually that all of us actually wanted to preserve our lives. Not everyone actually wanted to end our own lives. So human existence is a rational animal kind of existence. It is basically good to be as a rational animal created in the image and likeness of God, in the image of knowledge and love, intellect and will. Human life is specifically cognitive life, a life having the potential of self-expansion through knowledge and through love. Everything else in the physical universe exists to serve human life and is valued according to its ability to do just that. Since you are a human, you are not just driven with instincts, 
you do have knowledge and love. So, dapat hindi tayo masyado nagpapadala sa ating instincts as humans because like what was said here, you are created in the image and likeness of God. Thus, everything in the physical universe is instrumentally good while human life alone is basically good. The human person alone was built into existence by God for his own sake. Cruised, this human person who is fundamentally, intelligibly, and intrinsically good desires to know truth for its own sake. As Aristotle says in his Metaphysics, all men, by nature, desire to know. Knowing is a mode of existing. In knowing anything, one becomes what one knows. The intellect is in a way all things. Knowledge is a kind of self-expansion. Man always desires to be more fully and he exists most fully as a knower, as a seer. As Aristotle clearly saw, man's ultimate purpose in life clearly has something to do with knowing, which is his highest activity and accord to Aquinas, the highest mode of having. Then, beauty, man has, at the same time, a natural inclination to behold the beautiful, to see it, to intuit it, to contemplate it. So he visits art museums, listens to beautiful music, gazes at the sunset or the beautiful face of a child. And he even contemplates the beauty of divine providence. Indeed, his ultimate purpose has something to do with intuition, especially the intuition of beauty, and this is something that Plato understood well. And leisure, play, art, man is a maker. He brings all his sense and intellectual powers to bear upon the project of producing works of art, such as paintings, poetry, sculptures, buildings, monuments, and etc. Just for the sake of creating or playing games, just for the sake of playing, such as golf, cards, chess, etc. Indeed, there is a permanent and underlying element of contemplation of all of this. It is the man, the knower, who leisures. The person who plays has the cognitive power of complete self-reflection, and so he contemplates the marvel of his own skills and delights in the awareness of their gradual perfection. He contemplates his gifts and detects the giver underneath them. A good player is awed by the loss that he can detect behind an ordinary game of checks. For example, any player's delight in the intuition of the beauty of execution of a well-planned strategy that resulted in a touchdown or a goal or a home run. Even spectators contemplate and discuss these plays typically after the game. Contemplation permits the leisure of play and art carried out for their own sake. If it did not, no one would leisure. Then, sociability. The human person also inclines to harmony between himself and others. He is a social and political animal. He is born into a family and discovers himself through others, such as his parents and siblings. He intends to establish friendships. He is glad to see his friends, to hear their voices. Old 
ultimately, he wills to share the good that has come to him. Above all, he desires to share what he sees or knows with others. And others desire to share with him all that they have been gratuitously given, especially what they possess in knowledge, for knowledge is the highest mode of possessing anything. These others enable him to see what he was unable to see before. The perspectives they bring to him enlarge him, and they likewise are enlarged by what he brings them. His friendships are not merely utilitarian, rather the highest kind of friendship he seeks is benevolent friendship or true friendship. He has only a few genuine friends with whom he can share himself on such a profound level. So one person can have his or her own inner circle. But he inclines towards them because goodness is self-diffusive self and the more he is given, the more he wills to share what he has been given. And this is above all the case with what he sees or beholds that is what he knows, what he intuits or contemplates. Delighting in the presence of friends is nothing less than saying. It is a form of contemplation. Then religion, man aspires after what is higher than himself because he is aware of a desire in him for perfect happiness. He beholds his own finitude and the finitude of creation. He aspires to what is beyond the temporal to the eternal, yet he cannot transcend the limits of his own nature. But he dreams about it, as we see in Plato. He seeks to know the giver behind the gift of his existence that is behind the gift that is creation. As a spiritual nature is open to the whole of reality, the whole of being or universal being, he seeks to know the whole of reality that is to possess the monum universale. We know from revelation that he is not going to attain it on his own. He might think, as Plato did, that death will free him from the temporal in order to enter into the realm of the really real so as to contemplate subsistent beauty. So, Revelation tells us that this can only happen through God's initiative. He cannot, through his own natural faculties, attain God. If he is to attain the bonum universale, it can only be through another gratuitous giving or distinct from creation. He depends upon the divine initiative. In fact, even his own natural happiness is dependent upon the gratuitous self-giving of others, for he cannot force people to be his friends. And so, this dependency upon the divine initiative is not out of place at all for man knows already that an element of his own happiness is the feeling of having a debt that cannot be paid. Then marriage. Man is inclined to marry, to give himself completely to another, to belong to another exclusively in one flesh union. Even marriage, consummated by sexual union, is a kind of knowing. Mary says to the angel Gabriel, I do not know man. The giving of oneself in the marital act is a revealing of oneself to the other. One allows oneself to be known, and one gives oneself in order to be known by the other in a way that is exclusive and thus closed off to others. So, marriage is a special kind of knowledge of persons. 
nor will that the other see or behold what it knows, especially conjugal love. And both husband and wife will to beget human life, because goodness is the effusive and their unique conjugal relationship is good. They desire that a new life, the fruit of their love, share in what they know, namely the relationship they have with one another as well as with others, with creation, and with God. Then integrity. Man is inclined to seek integration within himself and integration of the complex elements of himself. This is because he seeks to be most fully and one along with good, beauty, and truth is a property of being. He is inclined to bring about a more intense unity within himself, namely harmony between his actions and his character, as well as his will and his passions. Bringing order to the passions, cultivating temperance and fortitude is a means to an end. A person aims to be temperate and brave for the sake of possessing the highest good, the possession of which is threatened by excessive sensuality and emotional disorder. So these are the primary principles of practical reason. We are the starting points of human action, the motivating principles behind every genuinely human action that we choose to perform. Now, the very first principle of morality is self-evident and is presupposed in every human action. That principle is good, is to be done, evil is to be avoided. So, elements that must be present for any complete or perfect act of the virtue. First is memoria or memory. So, Accurate memory that is true to reality and ability to learn from experience. If prudence were merely the knowledge of universal moral principles, we could stop here. But it is much more than that. Prudence requires a sensitivity and attunement to the here and now of the real world of real people. It requires a great deal of experience. That is why Aquinas lists memory as an integral part of the virtue of prudence, for experience is the result of many memories. There is more to memory than the simple recall of facts. Memory is more an ability to learn from experience, and so it involves an openness to reality, a willingness to allow oneself to be measured, what is real. This quality of openness is not as widespread as we might tend to believe at first. Some people just don't seem to learn from experience. That is, they don't seem to remember how this or that person reacted to their particular way of relating to them. For they continue to make the same mistakes in their way of relating to others. It is as if they have no memory of last week or last month, or last year. They lack a true to being memory because they do not will to conform to what is real, but have made a stubborn decision to have reality conform to the way they want the world to be. So that means we have to actually learn from our own experiences to actually change ourselves. And if we want to improve ourselves, okay? We have to learn from our own experiences. That is why the study of history is so important for the development of political prudence. For how often have we heard the old adage that those who do not learn from history are condemned to repeat its mistakes? Once again, I do hope that with this, we learn from our own Past so that we learn from our own mistakes. And we also don't do what our ancestors have done 
already before. We have to really understand our own country's history and even our world history so that we don't repeat what our ancestors' mistakes. Then, docility or docilitas, an open-mindedness that recognizes variety and is able to seek and make use of the experience and authority of others. Those who lack memory who more than likely lack docility another integral part of prudence. So St. Thomas writes, prudence is concerned with particular matters of action and since such matters are of infinite variety, no one man can consider them sufficiently, nor can this be done quickly, for it requires length of time. Hence, in matters of prudence, man stands in very great need of being taught by others especially by old folk who have acquired an understanding of the ends in practical matters. So, docility is open-mindedness, and so it requires a recognition of one's own limitations and ready acceptance of those limits. Proud people who hope excessively in their own excellence will tend to make imprudent decisions because they fail to rely on others by virtue of their inordinate and unrealistic self-estimation. A person with false docility seeks the advice of others, but only those deemed most likely to be in agreement with him or of those similar depravity and who are thus unlikely to challenge the overall orientation of his life so that means we actually have to listen well to those people who even don't agree with us first intelligentsia the understanding of first principles then solertia or shrewdness quick-wittedness or the ability to evaluate a situation quickly. So shrewdness. Shrewdness is the ability to quickly size up a situation on one's own. So it involves the ability to pick up small clues and run with them. The shrewd are highly intuitive, subtle, and discreet. The shrewd are also able to detect evil behind a mask of goodness so as to be able to plan accordingly. Some people are dangerously unsuspecting of the, mod of the motives of evil, so they miss the clues that suggest a more ominous picture. For we tend to see in others what we see in ourselves, and if our motives are good, it is hard to suspect others of malice. Moreover, excessive empathy has a way of clouding the intuitive light of Sodesta, which is as memory and docility presuppose a good will, so too does shrewdness. So empathy is the ability to understand and share the feelings of others, experiencing their emotions as if they were one's own. It involves a deep connection with another person's perspective, fostering compassion and a sense of unity. Through empathy, individuals can offer genuine support, validating emotions and creating a foundation for meaningful relationships. This emotional intelligence extends beyond sympathy as it requires an active effort to comprehend diverse viewpoints. Empathy promotes kindness, cooperation, and a more harmonious society by acknowledging the unique struggles and joys of others. It is a fundamental aspect of human connection 
fostering understanding and enriching the fabric of interpersonal relationships. It can be the case that the inability to see is treated in a will not to see. For sometimes people would rather not think about what the clues could mean for fear of what they might discover about someone which in turn will affect their security in some way. As the old saying goes, there are none so blind as those who will not see. It can also be the case that a person has not learned to listen to his intuition or perhaps confuses a negative intuition with judging the heart of another and so dismisses his intuitive insights, especially negative ones. On the other hand, it is possible that a person wants to see evil where there really is none. This is not shrewdness, but suspicion, and it is often rooted in a spirit of pride. Then, ratio or reasoning. Discursive reasoning and the ability to research and compare alternatives. Once a person sizes up a particular situation, he needs to be able to investigate and compare alternative possibilities and to reason well from premises to conclusions. He will need to be able to reason about what needs to be done, that is, what the best alternative or option is that will realize the right end. Prudence thus presupposes a knowledge of the basics of logical reasoning. If a person cannot see through the most common logical fallacies, he will unlikely be able to consistently make prudent decisions. Some of, the, some of these common fallacies include begging the question or assuming the point that needs to be proven or ignoring the question, which consists in proving something other than the point to be established. False cause consists in assuming that when one event precedes another, it is the cause of the succeeding event. Then the fallacy of part and whole consists in attributing to a whole what belongs only to its parts. The fallacy of generalization, while the fallacy of misplaced authority consists in concluding that something is true because some body of authority, such as a medical doctor, said it. The fallacy of ad hominem, directed to the man, involves the rejection of some person's position, not by virtue of the argument itself, but by virtue of some unlikable aspect of the person. And the fallacy of the double standard consists in applying one standard for one group or individual and another standard for an opposing group or individual. An appeal to the people occurs when a speaker attempts to get some group to agree to a particular position by appealing solely to their bigotry, biases, and prejudices, or in some cases, merely to their desire to hear what they already believe. The fallacy of false analogy occurs when a person argues a position merely by drawing an analogy without justifying the use of the analogy. And the fallacy of novelty assumes that what is new and current is necessarily better or an improvement upon what is older. The more adept one becomes at saying true such deceptive reasoning. The less likely will one's decisions fall under its influence. Then, providentia or foresight, the capacity to estimate whether particular actions can realize goals. Foresight is the principal part of prudence. For the name itself, prudence is derived from the Latin providential, which means foresight. Foresight involves rightly ordering human acts to the right end. This, of course, presupposes that a person is ordered to the right end, which is the possession of God through knowledge and love. The greater his love for God, that is, the greater his charity, 
the greater will be his foresight. So, blessed are pure in heart, for they shall see God. For it is true charity that one attains God, and it is true this supernatural friendship that one grows in a connatural knowledge of God. The more a person is familiar with the city towards which he directs his steps, the more able he is to see which roads lead to that end and which roads lead away. The more a person is familiar with God, the more readily able he is to discern behavior inconsistent with that friendship. So, an impure heart that is a love of God mixed with an inordinate love of self will affect one's ability to see. An inordinate love of self will cause certain alternatives to have greater appeal. But these alternatives or means will not necessarily lead to the right, and a prudent man sees that, but the imprudent do not. And if they lack truth to be in memory, they will continue to fail to see it. Then, circumspection. It is the ability to take all relevant circumstances into account. It is possible that acts good in themselves and suitable to the end may become unsuitable in virtue of new circumstances. Circumspection is the ability to take into account all relevant circumstances. Showing affection to your spouse through a kiss is good in itself, but it might be unsuitable in certain circumstances, such as a funeral or in a public place. Telling certain jokes might be appropriate in one setting, but in inappropriate in another. And so, circumspection is the ability to discern which is which. This too, however, presupposes right epithet. A person lacking proper restraint or temperance with will lack thoughtfulness and the ability to consider how the people around him might be made to feel should he take a certain course of action. The lost fool, for example, lack counsel and tend to act recklessly, an egoist is also the less focused on others and more on himself, and so he too tends to lack proper circumspection. Then caution, the ability to mitigate risk, good choices can often generate bad effects. To, to choose not to act simply because bad consequences will likely ensue is contrary to prudence, but caution takes care to avoid those evils that are likely to result from a good act that we contemplate doing. For example, a priest who is about to speak out publicly against a piece of unjust legislation might anticipate offending members of his congregation. Out of cowardice or an inordinate love of comfort, he may choose not to say anything at all and thus risk harming others through his silence. A prudent priest, on the other hand, will speak out when not doing so, will harm others, yet caution will move him to prepare his congregation with a thorough preamble so as to minimize the chances of misunderstanding. And so, one must never do evil that good may come of it, but one may at times permit evil on condition that the action one is performing is good or indifferent, that one does not will or intend the evil effect, and that the good effects of one's action are sufficiently desirable to compensate for the allowing of the evil effect. Then prudential judgment. In ethics, a prudential judgment is one where the circumstances must be weighed to determine the correct action. Generally, it applies to situations where 
two people could weigh their circumstances differently and ethically come to a different conclusions. For instance, in the theory of just war, the government of a nation must weigh whether the harms they suffer are more than the harms that would be produced by their going to war against another nation that is harming them. The decision whether to go to war is therefore a prudential judgment. And potential parts of prudence. So first we do have good counsel. Counsel is research into the various means to the end of their circumstances. A person not entirely pure of heart, that is, whose charity is very defective, will have more options before him. For options that nevertheless have some appeal, the better the character, the less will these poorer options present themselves, for they will drop out of the picture very quickly. This can be compared to a person who is physically healthy and has good eating habits, and one who is unhealthy with poor habits. A typical menu will be more appealing to the one with poor eating habits, while a former deliberates over a few options, the healthier options on the menu. We've all heard the expression, where there is a will, there is a way, good counsel resulting from a greater hope, and a love for God generates energy and imagination needed to discover the best alternative to achieve the best end. So good judgment. Judgment is an assent to good and suitable means. Synesis is good common sense in making judgments about what to do and not what to do in ordinary matters. It is possible to take good counsel without having good sense so as to judge well, but to judge well on what to do or not to do in the here and now requires a right mind that is an understanding of first principles and precepts and indirectly a just will and well-disposed appetites. Without this, one's ideas will likely be distorted and one's judgment regarding the best means will be defective for as Aristotle points out, as a person is, so does he see. Then he writes, What seems good to a man of high moral standards is truly the object of wish, whereas a worthless man wishes anything that strikes his fancy. It is the same with a human body, People whose constitution is good find those things wholesome, which really are so, while other things are wholesome for invalids, and similarly, their opinions will vary as to what is bitter, sweet, hot, and heavy, and so forth. Just as the healthy man judges these matters correctly or so, in moral questions, a man whose standards are high judges correctly, and in each case, what is really, what is truly good will appear to him to be so. Thus, what is good and pleasant differs with different characteristics or conditions, and perhaps the chief distinction of a man of high moral standards is his ability to see the truth in each particular moral question, since he is, as it were, the standard and measure for such questions. The common run of people, however, are misled by pleasure. For though it is not the good, it seems to be so that they choose the pleasant in a belief that it is good and avoid the pain, thinking that is, it is evil. So known refers to the ability to discern and apply higher laws to matters that fall outside the scope of the more common or lower rules that typically guide human action. It involves good judgment regarding exceptions to ordinary rules. For example, students ordinarily are not permitted to play walkmans in a classroom 
but a possible exception to the rule might be the case of a student with a serious learning disability and who is highly sensitive to the slightest distractions. One may be able to think of a similar examples on a more judicial level. Then let's discuss who St. Thomas Aquinas is. So his feast day is January 28th and he is the patron of students at all universities. He was born on 1226 and died on 1274. He was canonized by Pope John 22 in 1323. So St. Thomas Aquinas was a medieval philosopher and theologian whose intellectual contributions profoundly shaped the course of Western thought. Born in Italy, he became a Dominican friar and is best known for reconciling Christian theology with the philosophy of Aristotle. Creating a synthesis it has had a lasting impact on both religious and secular philosophy. The Aquinas philosophy is often associated with scholasticism, a medieval philosophical and theological tradition that sought to reconcile faith with reason. His most influential work is the Summa Theologica, a comprehensive and systematic exposition of Christian theology. In this monumental work, Aquinas addressed a wide range of topics, including the existence of God, ethics, human nature, and the relationship between faith and reason. So one of Aquinas. Central philosophical ideas is the notion of natural theology. He argued that reason and revelation are not contradictory, but complementary ways of understanding the truth. Aquinas believed that God, as the ultimate source of truth, could be known both through the study of the natural world and through divine revelation. This integration of faith and reason was a departure from some earlier Christian thinkers who viewed faith as superior to reason. Aquinas' famous five ways are arguments for the existence of God based on observation and reason. This include the cosmological argument, the existence of a first cause, the teleological argument designed in the universe, and the moral argument, the existence of objective moral values. So while these arguments have been subject to criticism and refinement over the centuries, they remain influential in discussions about the existence of God. So St. Thomas Aquinas presented the five ways in his philosophical work, Summa Theologica, as arguments for the existence of God. First, once again, we do have the first way, the argument from motion or change, this argument is based on the observation that things in the world are in motion or undergo change. Aquinas posited that everything in motion must be set in motion by something else. This chain of movers cannot go on infinitely, so there must be an unmoved mover that initiated the motion. Aquinas identified this unmoved mover as God. Second way, the argument from efficient causes. This argument is rooted in the concept of cause and effect. Aquinas asserted that everything in existence is caused by something else, forming a chain of causes. Therefore, there must be a first cause, an uncaused cause, which Aquinas identified as God. And the third way, the argument from possibility and necessity Aquinas considered the existence of contingent beings, things that come into existence and could potentially not exist. If everything were contingent, there would have been a time when nothing existed. Since something does exist now, there must be a necessary being that exists by its own nature and causes the existence of contingent beings. Aquinas identified this necessary being as God. Then the fourth way, the argument from gradation of being, 
Aquinas observed a hierarchy or gradation in the quality of existence, some things are more or less good, true, or noble. This gradation implies the existence of a standard or a maximum for these qualities. Aquinas argued that this maximum, which all other things are measured against, is God. The nasty is the fifth way. The argument from design or teleological argument. This argument is based on the observation of order and purpose in the natural world. Aquinas argued that non-intelligent things like natural elements act towards an end or purpose. As they lack knowledge, they must be directed by an intelligent being. Aquinas identified this intelligent being as God, the ultimate designer. It's important to note that these arguments are a product of their historical context and have been the subject of extensive philosophical and theological discussion and critique over the centuries. So Aquinas also made significant contributions to ethics. He developed a natural law theory that posits a universal moral order based on the nature of human beings. So according to Aquinas, humans have an inherent understanding what is morally right and ethical principles can be derived through reason. In his philosophy of human nature, Aquinas integrated Aristotelian ideas with Christian theology. And Aquinas' views on the relationship between faith and reason had a profound impact on the Catholic Church. His ideas were influential at the Council of Trent and continued to shape Catholic theology. However, his philosophy also faced criticism, especially during the Renaissance and Enlightenment periods when some philosophers and theologians sought to emphasize the autonomy of reason. So in summary, St. Thomas Aquinas was a towering figure in, med in medieval philosophy whose synthesis of Christian theology and Aristotelian philosophy significantly influenced Western thought. His emphasis on the compatibility of faith and reason, natural theology, and natural law theory continued to be relevant in contemporary discussions in philosophy, theology, and ethics. So to end our lesson for today, a word from a quote from Thomas Aquinas, humility is the mark of a genuine disciple. So thank you. So that's all for today. Does anyone have any question regarding today's lesson?